All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show. So I want to put away our space trivia questions and that important message on the screen because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. <gasps> Ooh. And uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not just a, a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person, and I'm standing right behind you up at the planetarium booth. So I uh, just want to let you know that I'm here. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one enormous screen. Thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome. That's going to give us that very immersive experience that y'all will see in just a little bit. And uh, just to let you know, folks, the show that we're going to be watching right now is one of my favorites to do because this show is different from all the other previous shows that we've done here today in the planetarium. This show is something we call Tour of the Universe. Essentially, with Tour of the Universe, I'm going to be talking for the next 30 minutes, and we're going to be starting off pretty close to planet Earth, and we're going to zoom all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. Hopefully, by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are, but just a warning, we are very small in the grand scheme of things, so just a heads up. And uh, before we get started with our planetarium show, folks, i got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a great experience in the planetarium. There's quite a few of us here. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. So if you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are tucked away till the very end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean for all of our guests coming in today and in the future. And also, folks, uh, if please make sure to keep your feet off the seats. We want to make sure the seats stay nice and clean for all of our guests. So make sure those feet are on the floor and not on the seats. We do appreciate it. Also, folks, if you happen to have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light or loud sound, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes, as these devices can be very distracting in a very dark environment like our planetarium, not only for yourself, but for the folks sitting around you. So again, we do appreciate that. And also, folks, remember to please wear your mask above your nose at all times while we're in the planetarium. People tend to forget that we breathe out of our nose, so we want to make sure those are covered up as well. We're going to be here for about 30 minutes. There looks like there's about 20 of us here in the planetarium dome. So again, I uh, can't stress that enough. Thank you so much, folks. And also, folks, if you do need to exit the planetarium for any reason during the show, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And last but not least, folks, this show is very immersive thanks to our 70-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and then your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not flying through space, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go for our planetarium show. We're just going to wait for those last few cell phones to get put away, and then we'll get started. So once again, if you have your cell phone out, make sure those are put away right now. All righty, folks. Looks like all cellular devices have been put away. So let's get started with our tour of the universe. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, but not exactly right at Earth. We can see the Earth just below us right over here, but we're going to be starting at this really amazing uh, human feet uh, right in front of us, something called the International Space Station, or what we also like to call it, the ISS, because incredibly long, long name. But this thing is fantastic. I love the International Space Station space station because this is the largest thing we humans have ever put into orbit around our planet earth and uh pretty much what the international space station is is that it's a research facility orbiting around our planet so they like to conduct different types of science experiments that they can't conduct on earth so something a little bit further away with less gravity so some of the different types of science experiments that they'll conduct up here are things like what happens when you try to grow plants in space do the plants grow in the same uh, mat way uh just because you're way out here, roots tend to grow uh, when plants are on Earth. 
uh, they tend to grow their roots towards gravity, which is towards our planet Earth. But what happens when you take those plants away from our planet? Do the roots grow in a different uh, pattern? Uh, what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does it behave differently with less gravity? So these are some of the different questions that scientists want to figure out out here in space. And just to let you know, the International Space Station first began in the early 19, uh, in 1998 by Russia. It started off with this first lunar module, or this module right here in the middle. And ever since then, different, com or different countries have been adding different modules to it. So it's been getting bigger over the years. And just to let you know, folks, the International Space Station looks relatively large here on our planetarium dome, but it's not that big per se. It's only about the size of an American football field. Uh, if you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. You can also use the California Academy of Sciences, the, muse the building that we're in right now, if you were to go from one garden all the way to the other side, to the other garden. So that's how big the International Space Station is. And it looks also incredibly far away from our planet, but the International Space Station isn't too far away either. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of our planet. 225 miles, whew, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. And also to let you know, folks, the International Space Station is going incredibly fast. It's going to whop in 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. <laughs> and also to let you know, folks, uh, this is as far as we put humans into space because traveling into space gets quite costly quite rapidly. For instance, you got to build yourself a rocket ship or get your hand on a rocket ship, and then you have to account, get your hands on a whole lot of rocket fuel. And I mean a whole lot of rocket fuel. And then once you get all that rocket fuel, you got to account for all the food, water, all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here in space. So the bill starts to get quite costly quite rapidly. And also to let you know, folks, uh, the International Space Station just announced that uh, it's going to be retiring the space station in 2031. So a little less than 10 years, about nine years or so. And they're going to crash it into the Pacific Ocean at this point called Point Nemo, which is the furthest of... Uh, furthest point away from any landmass. I think the closest landmass from that point is about 2,000 miles or so. So that's where most spacecrafts tend to go. It's the graveyard of spacecrafts. But let's uh, zoom away from the International Space Station. And now we're going to slowly see it disappear compared to our planet. Looks like we're hovering just above California, Nevada. We can see the Bay Area just down below, right over there. And before we lose track of the International Space Station, I want to add a nice orbital path so we can keep track of it where it's at as we continue zooming out. All righty, folks, as we continue zooming out and we now have a much larger uh, view of our world, I also want to let you know that this space program that I'm using here in the planetarium is something that you can go home and download if you like. The program that I'm using in here is something called Open Space Project. So if you go to your favorite uh, search engine, type in Open Space Project, you can download this at home and fly through the universe just like how I am. But just a heads up, uh, Open Space is not completely finished. It's in its beta phase, which means that we may experience uh, some glitches or bugs here and there. If we do, I'll point them out. And also just another heads up, uh, this program uses a whole lot of information and processing power. So if you have an older computer, you may, want not, you may not want to download it as it may uh, overload your computer. But if you have a newer one or a gaming computer, highly recommend it. Very fun to do. And folks, if you don't want to download anything, but you still want to fly through the universe how I am right now, uh, you can just type into your favorite search engine, NASA's Eyes. Uh, so just like your human eyeballs, just type in NASA's eyes. It'll take you to a website, and you can fly through our solar system. It is very fun. But with that being put aside, uh, let's head over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. All righty, folks. Now, to let you know, uh, we humans have been to the moon, but that was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon, conduct science, and of course, they got to play golf up here as well. And it looks like we have about a half moon right now, but luckily we're in the planetarium. I have some special abilities in here, so I'm going to turn off the nighttime so we can see the moon in all of its glory. 
hey, that looks pretty familiar. But again, folks, the last time we sent humans to the moon was 1972, so a little more than 50 years ago. But don't worry, uh, NASA has a new space mission in the works that's going to be sending humans to the moon in the next few years. This new space mission is called Artemis, which is pretty funny to say because Artemis is the sister to Apollo in Greek mythology. NASA is really clever with coming up with these space mission names. But pretty much with Artemis, they're going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases on the moon. Why are they going to be setting up lunar bases? Well, the whole mission for Artemis is to send humans to Mars. But before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out how exactly we're going to live out here in space. So the moon is a perfect stepping stone to figure out all those logistics, how we're going to survive out here in space. So they'll be setting up multiple lunar uh, bases all around this, um, the moon. For example, maybe they want to check out this lava tube right over here. They'll set up a lunar base right over there. Maybe they want to go check out the highlands, uh, the high mountains over here uh, on, the, on the moon. Uh, maybe they want to check out the Maria, this flatter, newer soil um, regolith over here. And what's also really neat is that if anything was to go wrong while they're on the moon, they're also going to be having a space station orbit around the moon. Uh, it's going to be called Lunar Gateway, kind of just like how we saw with the International Space Station, but one for the moon. So again, if anything was to go wrong, those astronauts can launch off the surface of the moon and head back to that space station where they would be safe. So again, we humans should be back on the moon in the next few years. Crossing my fingers, hopefully everything goes according to plan. But uh, look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years, y'all. And from here on Earth, uh, when we look up at the moon, especially in the nighttime, sometimes it feels like the moon's so close you can reach out your arms and touch it, especially when it's really close to the horizon. But folks, the moon is incredibly far away from us. It's roughly about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles away, that is quite a distance. Now, some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it, and if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop, although I wouldn't recommend it. The roads out here are poorly maintained. Hee hee hee. And uh, from here on out, folks, we're going to need to use the use a more useful measuring stick because at this distance, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement of light speed. Now, light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, it's time for us to leave the moon for, uh, for now. So everybody say, bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And folks, on our journey, we're going to be heading out into a much greater realm of our solar system because now we're going to see the moon and the Earth as they slowly recede. In fact, let me add the planet trail so we can see where everything is out here in space because we tend to lose objects. And not only that, folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now the nearest star to us comes into the view, the sun, do, 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 do. And the sun's roughly about 93 million miles away from the Earth. Whew, 93 million miles is a really large distance. But that's not too far away in terms of speed of light. So again, uh, we're right here at the Earth, third rock from the sun. The sun's right over here, third rock from the sun. And uh, again, 93 million miles to, from the Earth to the sun. Now, for light to travel that distance, it only takes it about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light, which is a really cool concept to keep in mind because let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, it was no longer emitting sunlight, that last bit of sunlight would travel that 93 million miles, that eight and a half minutes at the speed of light, and then finally that last bit of sunlight would reach us here on Earth, and then all of a sudden the daytime would become nighttime. Now, this also really works for uh, really far away objects as well. For example, let's say we're looking at a star that's 60 light years away from us, well, we're looking at that star as it looked like 60 years ago because that light that just reached us traveled that long distance of 60 years to get to us. So when we're looking at really far away objects in space, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense. Pretty cool. But now we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system. So really quickly, I'm going to name all the objects in our solar system. 
So right in the middle, we have our sun, the biggest thing. And the closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places we can land a spacecraft on. And then past the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if we're to highlight all the asteroids in our asteroid belt. There we go. Quite a few of them there. Now, what's also really neat is that the people who discovered the asteroid belt uh, was this space organization in the early 1800s, and they called themselves the Celestial Police, which kind of sounds like something out of Doctor Who. Hee <laughs> hee. But past the asteroid belt, we also have the really big planets, our gas giants. We have the Jovians. We've got Jupiter and Saturn. And then we have our icy giants, our icy gas giants. We have Uranus and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here is the orbit of Pluto for y'all. Right over there on the top right of the screen. And just to let you know, folks, uh, Pluto hangs out in this outer part of our solar system past the orbit of Neptune in a region called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt's going to be all this stuff. Whoa. So again, mostly what you're going to find out here in the Kuiper Belt region is uh, icy comets, short period comets that don't travel too far away from the sun. So it's kind of like the second asteroid belt all the way out here past the orbit of Neptune. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now really quickly, I'm going to be adding some of the different spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system so we can learn more about it. And there we go, just a little bit jump there, no worries. So on screen, we have the trajectories of uh, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We can see that interaction right over here on the top right. And we we're able to get some amazing high definition images of Pluto uh, from that flyby. Now, all of these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not yet traveled as far as light travels in a single day. Now, in order for light to travel all the way out here to the orbit of Pluto, it takes about five light hours. So again, at the speed of light, about five hours. But let's leave our planetary scale behind, folks, because now we're going to be heading into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And if my cal calculations is correct, uh, Alpha Centauri is going to be this bottom left uh, planetary star right there. And again, we're right in the middle. So again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But four years doesn't really put into perspective how long it would take us humans to travel there. So if we were to get into a rocket ship of today and we were to blast off and head over to the next star system, it's going to take us over 8,500 years just to get over to the next star system. Whew, that's a very long road trip. Alrighty, folks. But let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. Whoa. So again, we are now inside something called the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted, or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. Now, this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, and radar signals, and then later, the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they travel at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And folks, right now, I want to be adding some markers onto the screen. These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found a 
closely about 5,000 exoplanets in just the nearby vicinity to us. And in fact, you can see a nice portion of exoplanets right over here in the very top right of the screen. We pointed our space telescopes in that direction. We found a whole heap of exoplanets. So these uh, space telescopes are constantly scanning the night sky, trying to find as, any, as many exoplanets as possible. So that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue. Now, to figure out if any of them are Earth-like with conditions for life suitable for us, well, that's a whole different question. Um, we're not able to answer that question just quite yet, but we do have new astronomical instruments that are being developed right now. So in the next few years, we'll be able to answer that question. But the more important point, important point here is that quite a few of those planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody out there that's able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in this planetary system right over here. We find an alien civilization that's about 60 light years away from us. Let's say over here. So let's shoot them a text message. So we're going to shoot them a text message. We'll just say hi. That travels about 60 years uh, to get to them. They listen in, answer back. They reply another 60 years. That is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I could barely wait for a text message from my friend. But, of course, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere more than 90 light years away have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. But for now, folks, I'm going to be putting away those exoplanet markers, because there's just a whole lot of them. But I want to leave our radio sphere up on the screen. As huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So let's zoom on out and get a better look of, of our galaxy. Alrighty, folks. So we zoomed so far back now that we're looking down in our Milky Way galaxy. And can anybody see their house from up here? <laughs> just kidding. Now, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross it from one side all the way to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. Whew, that is a very, very uh, large galaxy. But not only that, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I do want to show you the shape of it from a sideways perspective. So let's zoom out just a little bit so we can see it from a sideways. You're going to realize that our Milky Way galaxy is a flat spiral disk. So when astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's so much more easier for them to point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, nebula, black holes, things that obscure their view at looking at the universe. So keep that in mind. That's going to come important later on the show. We like to look galactically north and galactically south. But the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many, many galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, folks, every single point of light that you're now going to see no longer represents a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small, also includes the nearest spiral, large spiral to us, the Andromeda galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, uh, you're going to start to realize that galaxies aren't evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to cluster or group together in these large uh, galaxy clusters, or they like to avoid each other where they leave very large voids. So we can see a few nice galaxy clusters right over here, another galaxy cluster right over there. We can see some voids towards the top of our screen. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. But folks, we've zoomed so far back out now that the, this picture represents the closest 30,000 galaxies uh, in a space over 300 million light years across. We've got to give thanks to, our, um, to an amazing astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii, who worked over decades of time with other astronomers to compile this amazing representation so that we can fly through this, uh, this galactic map in our planetarium. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tolley. 
But now we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now, folks, we're about to see the large-scale structure of the universe. And remember, folks, every single point of light that you're seeing is an individual galaxy, not a star. So again, we are now looking at the large-scale structure of the universe. And just a heads up, folks, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly, especially when we fly around in this uh, particular view. Remember when I mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of our Milky Way galaxy? Well, if we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would line up just like this. We're, and again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through that plane of the Milky Way. But scientists still want to make sure that there was galaxies through the, the plane of our Milky Way so we can still see this nice purple survey of galaxies right over there. You'll notice that we can't find as many galaxies as opposed to looking north and south, and it doesn't go or extend as far. Pretty much we have to wait for our technology to improve, and then we'll be able to map all those galaxies that we haven't mapped out yet in those dark regions. So it's just a matter of time. But it looks like we're running close out of time, folks. So let's continue zooming out because we still have a little ways to go to the, get to the very edge of the known universe. And now we're going to be zooming so far away, folks. We're going to be looking at these really distant objects known as the quasars. And the quasars, they're going to be represented by these nice orange dots at the very edge of the large-scale structure of the universe. But what exactly are the quasars? Well, the quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're going to now step into the very edge of the observable universe. All right, so we are at the very edge of the observable universe. And what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And this is not a typical photo either. Instead, what we're looking at is a temperature density image, where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. Now, these fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to a large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go, and that's going to be back home. Now, before we make our return trip back to planet Earth, I've got to ask y'all to prepare yourself because this could possibly be the worst free-falling dream ever. Hee hee hee. But let's make a return trip back home through all these quasars and galaxies. And folks, we are crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes. Preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I'll remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we are flying back into our Milky Way galaxy. We are heading straight for that radio sphere. 
And of course, we are making our way downtown, walking fast faces, passing our homebound. <laughs> and now we're entering our planetary system. Passing those spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing the Kuiper Belt, passing the main asteroid belt, and heading to the third rock from the sun, our homeworld, Earth, the only place humans have ever existed and lived. And now we're about to pass the orbit of the moon, uh, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into space. And folks, as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, this is going to be the end of our tour of the universe. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. But uh, with that, folks, it looks like we made it back home safe and sound. And that's going to be the end of our show. Thank you so much, y'all. Take care.